This is the uh, introduction to Core DNS session. And uh, my name's Cricket Lou. I am the EVP, or actually one of the EVPs of engineering for Infoblox, uh, and their chief DNS architect, whatever that means. Um, I was also the, the co-author of DNS and Bind, which is a blue and white book that has a grasshopper in the cover, if you've ever seen that. And uh, I thought I was the co-author of all of O'Reilly's books on DNS, and then I found out actually that there's apparently a new one called DNS and DevOps or something like that. So uh, I'm no longer the only author of DNS books for, for O'Reilly. I'm just one of them. And this is Yong Tang. And uh, Yong is the director of engineering for MobileIron. Do you want to say a little bit about what you've been working on? Uh, it's uh, mostly just, uh, I mean, most of my uh, work related to open source is just about uh, Docker and the core DNS. Uh, I have some other interest in machine learning as well, but that's only most recently. Yeah, most of work. I, I'm, I'm just going to talk about my open source contribution. Yeah. <laughs> All right, fantastic. So um, the agenda for today looks something like this. We'll start with a, a few slide introduction to Core DNS so you can kind of find out what it's all about. And then I'll give you a status update on where it is with relations uh, to Kubernetes. And then Yong will do all the heavy lifting. Uh, he'll talk about uh, the roadmap. He'll talk about the use of Core DNS for service discovery. And he'll go through the core file, which is a, a Core DNS configuration file, and show you some of the Core DNS plugins in action. And then at the end, we should have time for some Q&A if you guys have any questions that you'd like to ask. All right, so let's start by talking a little bit about what Core DNS is. So first of all, it is a flexible DNS server that's written in Go. Now that's important right off the bat because you inherit some of the goodness from Go, right? You get the fact that it's memory safe, for example, which if you've ever run, for example, a bind name server is a big deal. Um, those of you who have had the, the misfortune, let's say, of running a bind name server for, for many, many years know that there have been lots and lots of buffer overruns, lots of vulnerabilities uh, found in, in bind over the years, right? Um, it's a plugin-based architecture, uh, very easily extended. In fact, um, there's a session later on that uh, John Bellamark and some other folks are presenting where they'll actually talk a little bit about how, how you can write a, a plugin. But even if you're not comfortable writing plugins, there are lots of plugins out there already. In fact, uh, there are about 34 different plugins that are actually shipped as part of uh, Core DNS today that perform all kinds of different functions. Uh, Yong will go through some of those. There's even a list in here in case you want to jot them down. Um, it supports DNS, of course, right? Any DNS server does. It also supports DNS over TLS and DNS over gRPC. Um, DNS over TLS uh, is called DOT for short nowadays. That's uh, uh, all the rage among the cool kids. So if you want to set up your own recursive DNS server and run DOT between your new Android P phone and, uh, and the recursive DNS server, well, this is, this is one way to do it. Um, it was started and led by Meet Gieben, who is uh, a Dutch guy who lives in London and now works for Goldman Sachs. Meek was originally known as uh, the author of kind of the standard DNS library written in Go, one that lots and lots of people uh, used. And I think that he kind of took a look at the Caddy web server and said, you know, that's a really nice architecture. And here I have this very easy to use DNS library written in Go, and it was one of those sort of chocolate and peanut butter moments, and out came Core DNS, right? Combination of the two of those. Um, Core DNS's focus really is on service discovery, right? Which is what probably many of you have used it for, or many of you will use it for. Um, there is native support for Kubernetes. There's a, a Kubernetes plugin, which allows you to get service discovery information directly out of Kubernetes and publish it via DNS. There's also direct integration with etcd. If you'd prefer to integrate directly with etcd, you can do that. And there's integration with, for example, uh, AWS's Route 53. So if you want to be able to look into the authoritative data that's being made available by Route 53 from another DNS server and republish that, you can do that. There's support for metrics using Prometheus. You can also forward to a recursive DNS server. You can proxy for various other name servers. That's important because uh, today, Core DNS cannot act as a full-service recursive DNS server. In other words, it can't start at the root of the namespace, follow referrals until it finds the authoritative name servers for some zone, and then ask it for an answer. 
right? So it has to rely on another name server in order to do that. Whatever, bind, unbound, what have you. Um, there have been some discussions. Meek uh, tipped us off to, to the fact that he's been talking to the folks who wrote SDNS, which is a, uh, a fast, lightweight recursive DNS server, which was also written using his Go DNS library. And so there's some possibility that that might end up a plugin that you can just use within uh, Core DNS to do a, a full service recursive. So now I'll take uh, 20 or 30 minutes to read through the 34 different plugins uh, that are available as part of Core DNS. And I'll point out a couple of these that are actually worth noting. Um, you'll see, for example, there's DNSSEC support. That's about halfway or a third of the way down. So if you're into that kind of thing, then you can automatically sign your zones. Core DNS does uh, on-the-fly signing. There are some restrictions to the implementation. Uh, you can't use NSEC 3, which is, uh, uh, NSEC 3 is, is authenticated denial of existence. <laughs> and uh, it's designed to thwart uh, what's called a pseudo zone walking attack. Um, so you can't use that. You have to use plain vanilla NSEC, uh, if you know what that is. You can't use split uh, zone signing and key signing keys. You have to use a common signing key and a few things like that. But otherwise, it works really, really well. Uh, etcd, which is reading zone data from etcd, uh, we mentioned that forward, which is obviously forwarding to another name server somewhere, and Kubernetes, uh, the plugin down at the bottom, which is, of course, the one that most of you guys will probably end up using. Um, if you're interested, we do also have a talk specifically about using Core DNS with Kubernetes that's tomorrow about midday. I think it's about 12.30 or so. So uh, please sign up for that if you're interested. A few other things I'll point out. There's Prometheus. Uh, proxy rewrite is pretty interesting. Rewrite gives you an amazing level of control over rewriting inbound queries and outbound answers. You can rewrite domain names to other domain names. You can, you can manipulate almost any part of the DNS message, stuff that you really can't do with almost any other name server. Uh, Rep 53, which I also mentioned. So lots and lots and lots. And these are only what we call the in-tree plugins. There are also a whole bunch of contributed plugins as well. In fact, today, if you wanted uh, a full recursive DNS server, you could use the Unbound plugin, compile that in, and go. Current project status uh, for Unbound, you probably heard some of this during the keynote this morning. We're at release 1.2.6, which came out about a month ago. Uh, its status within the CNCF is incubating. Uh, it's been moving along pretty rapidly, and we're told it's going to go for its graduation vote at almost any time. So probably very, very soon now. Uh, it's a growing community of, of devs who are contributing to it, about 113 different contributors, 16 maintainers, many of whom are in the, the room today, uh, 29 plus public adopters, and now over 3,000 stars. And then I'll, I also wanted to mention, or actually, actually Yang wanted to mention, the contributions of uh, our Google Summer of Code uh, intern who worked on it, Jiasheng uh, Zhu. Uh, he's a student at the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne in Switzerland. And uh, he wrote an interesting application of Core DNS called ID at CD, which is a distributed server setup system using it. And this is his second year in a row working on Core DNS as part of the Google Summer of Code. So big thanks to him. And then the last thing I'll mention is just that every one of the plugins in Core DNS is now backed, actually has official owners, which is good. We added within the new release uh, a new loop detection plugin. And as you heard this morning, finally, Core DNS has become a standard part of Kubernetes. So with 1.13, um, it's the default DNS server shipped with Kubernetes. Uh, we had hoped to make it in, in the 1.12 release and unfortunately, we had a little issue. It was actually pretty minor. Our memory utilization was just a hair higher than memory utilization with the old cube DNS. So we did a little bit of tuning, managed to get the memory utilization down to where it's actually lower than cube DNS. So let me turn this over to you. Do you want the, the mic? There is the mic.
Okay, let's continue the project status. Uh, one thing we including us is that we care about security very much, and uh, we perform a security review this year. The security was handled by Q53, which is a company from <coughs> Germany, and by the name, that's, uh, that's probably a coincidence, but that's also magic number 53. <laughs> so initially, I saw this company was from was uh, doing mostly DNS release security, but turns out they are doing everything. Uh, this security review was sponsored by CNCF. In fact, we are the first project that went through the audit. Uh, we find several issues. One is the cache spoofing, which has been fixed quickly in 1.1.1. And we have uh, two other small bugs that has been fixed. Uh, one thing I would like to say is uh, one comment from Q53 folks was that they, when they revealed the coding, as they, they actually switched to uh, protocol vulnerability almost immediately. That's because they realized that's in Go, so there's almost no issue with buffer flow. That's a uh, very sharp uh, very sharp in comparison with other uh, DNS implementations because, as you may know, a lot of DNS uh, servers are written in C or C++, and uh, they have to worry about uh, buffer flows very much. This is also the reason Red Hat actually was in very supportive of uh, seeing core DNS in Kubernetes even at the early stage because they are very concerned with DNS mass kill. So again, that's uh, Q53. That's uh, first, uh, via the first project went through the audit. Uh, so now let's go to the roadmap. So uh, in the core, the core thing is the core is relatively stable and we have some enhancement, but not, not too much. Uh, we have lots of change in, uh, lots of enhancement in the plugin. So for Kubernetes, of course, with the, with we reach a default in Kubernetes. So we expect to see a lot of, uh, maybe a lot of issue, a lot of bugs to surface. So we plan to make a dramatic improvement uh, as more users are using CoreDNS in Kubernetes. Uh, in log, we have some additional features and enhancement like metadata, uh, cache. That's one of the focuses on performance improvement. The Resolver is a very interesting plugin. The, we actually receive a lot of uh, interest to see okay, why Cordian is still not re supporting a Resolver. But turns out that we have some uh, external folks that are willing to contribute as well. So we are in uh, early discussion, but likely we will see some Resolve plugin pretty soon. Uh, another interesting point is uh, cloud integration. So we already support Route 53 on AWS. Uh, but on the other hand, we have support like a Google DNS or like have any support for Microsoft's cloud. Uh, the, one of the issue is that the limited resource, but there are some interest from some of the external folks that are willing to contribute to uh, Google's cloud DNS. So let's see if we can land another cloud vendor support. And finally, we're talking about the CNCF graduation. We already submitted the pull request, so hopefully the graduation process will be pretty smooth. So let's see. Uh, now let's talk about the core DNS. One of the things, features with core DNS is that it's used core file. The core file is actually pretty much similar to CAD file, which is, it reminds you of the association between core DNS and uh, CAD HTTP. Uh, so the first example give you a uh, authority DNS server. The second example give you a recursive DNS server. As you could see, we are using proxy to point to Google's 8.8.8.8. Now, of course, you can use some other things. For example, in Cloudflare, they have the uh, so-called privacy preserving DNS server, which is 1.1.1.1. Of course, now everyone uses quad, either quad one or quad eight or quad nine. I mean, that's uh, just for memorize all those configurations. It's already simple enough, but people still want to make it even simpler. Uh, now we talk about survey discovery. When, I mean, over the past several years, a lot of people actually raise a question to me, say, okay, Nowadays, you have uh, cloud vendors pretty much virtualize everything. Uh, like on AWS, you have the VPC. You, if you want to have IP address, you can grab any IP address you like. You could use uh, 
uh, elastic network interface to, to do that. You also have all the flexibility to do anything you like without even using a DNS. Why would you still want to have a DNS? I mean, that's an interesting question. One argument that I would put for us is that the DNS is actually a very nice and flexible indirection. And this indirection actually give you plenty of options. For example, uh, with this indirection, if you, with this indirection, you actually could change your service endpoint without changing your network infrastructure. Uh, this may not be a big deal at the moment, but you never know what's going to happen in the future. I mean, for example, let's say you have a very sophisticated network system that's on AWS, you're not using DNS. Now, all of a sudden, your, let's say your upper management, your boss decided to say, let's change the direction, let's everything move to Google Cloud. All of a sudden, you're going to scratch your head, say, what, what are we supposed to do? With DNS, this nice indirection gives you the flexibility to change everything. But in the front end, your user will not be impacted. And I think that's the most important thing about uh, uh, using DNS for survey discovery. Uh, this one is a uh, core cool files field. As you could see, it has a focus on survey discovery. It has several components. The first component is just obviously it's a Kubernetes integration. I mean, of course, uh, we are talking about CNCF, so the biggest chunk of core DNS is, is involving uh, Kubernetes. The second piece, as you can see, it's just one line that's actually enable your raw phase three uh, cloud data sync up. So the, the good thing with uh, AWS raw phase three is that it actually will not go through the DNS channel or go through the UDP. It just goes through AWS API. So even if you are outside of AWS, you can still get the data sync up. The third piece, as you can see, that's a host file. The host file is just essentially like your local host file as well, except you could inline. That means if you have uh, several record, you could just do that, just add in your uh, core file. Uh, that's actually kind of interesting. A lot of people talk about uh, host file. They say, okay, host file, you only have like five records. That's nice. If you have a lot more records, uh, is that feasible? Actually, one issue raised in coding as repo was that when people try to use a very big profile of 80K uh, record, it still works. So hopefully that's, uh, that's just uh, give people uh, more confident using coding as in any way they like. Uh, we also have the health, as you can see, and uh, metrics as for Prometheus. And finally, there's some additional things of uh, caching, that's going to improve your performance slightly. And uh, finally, they have the forward, which is an, just a proxy, uh, just a, essentially like a proxy for the anything else uh, to 1.1.1.1, that's uh, Cloudflare. Uh, so just, uh, just to make it clear, I'm not uh, working for Cloudflare. I have no interest in <laughs> selling the product. So it's just a coincidence. I'm just trying to pick up an example to show what you could do. Uh, so now we talk about survey discovery from previous page. Now let's see what exactly is the configuration. You have a Kubernetes cluster. Of course, you have a core DNS. Uh, when you deploy core DNS, the core DNS can talk to Kubernetes, and Kubernetes uh, node or pod could talk to uh, core DNS. Uh, it also, the coding as is actually deployed in a mixing environment. As you can see, you have the uh, Kubernetes cluster, but you also have some other services exposed outside the Kubernetes cluster. This is very important, and that's actually one of the strengths of DNS because you, when you deploy services, it's never a pure thing. It's never just say, I have everything inside Kubernetes. That's never happened in real life. You definitely have something outside of Kubernetes. Now, what are you going to do? DNS will help you. As you can see, you might have some service you don't want to manage in Kubernetes, then you could use uh, AWS or Office 3. If you have some additional files that's, uh, let's say, on your IT infrastructure, the same old IT infrastructure you use every day, now you could add a couple of uh, records in, as an inline host plugin. You also could forward uh, additional, uh, additional DNS queries to any DNS server you like, maybe some privacy preserving or some additional service, DNS server you like. Uh, but that's not uh, the only way to deploy with uh, core DNS in Kubernetes cluster. Uh, 
uh, we talk about Kubernetes, there are actually ma many ways to deploy that. This is another format to deploy. So in the previous slide, we talked about Kubernetes as a part of the, uh, we talked about coding as a part of Kubernetes cluster in this slide. As you can see, your core DNS could actually be outside of Kubernetes. And that's very interesting, and uh, sometimes it helps you. Uh, if you look into that, the Kubernetes actually plugin actually point to multiple endpoint. We have, uh, we pretty much the same thing, except the, the core DNS plugin actually sit outside, talking to API servers, and uh, the core DNS server from outside will receive query from outside of Kubernetes, Kubernetes cluster itself as well. So like I said, the, the best thing about core DNS is it's very flexible. If you are deploying inside a Kubernetes cluster, outside a Kubernetes cluster, it always gives you one option to do that. Uh, this is very useful in a hybrid environment. And also this is the strength of uh, having flexibility because you never know what you're gonna do. Maybe you want to have your customer to talk to some of the uh, some of the pod inside the Kubernetes, that's possible, or we'll talk to some of the containers, that's also possible. Uh, we talk about the survey discovery, we talk about the core file, and now let's talk about the community. So uh, we have a fairly active community. The most active one, obviously, is a GitHub. Uh, all the maintainers are on GitHub every day. We also have a Slack channel. The, Many maintainers are actually on Slack channel as well. The only issue with Slack channel is that nowadays almost every organization, every company has their own workspace. So it's actually hard to switch from one <laughs> workspace to another. That's why sometimes you couldn't find uh, some of the people there because they are pr probably busy with some, uh, some other Slack workspace. For us, we use a Slack channel as part of CNCF. That actually helps us. Because people, if you're on CNCF, you can just uh, just 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 check the core DNS channel and see what's happening. And if you have a question, you can always ask. Uh, we also have other resources like we have website, we have blog, we have Twitter. Uh, the finally, we have a Google group, but this one is not very active. So I don't know if that's a good choice to suggest you to to seek help from Google, Google group. Uh, Okay, now the, the final piece about this uh, introduction session is about uh, contribution to core DNS. So if anyone say, okay, I have a lot of interest in core DNS, I want to help, so how could I help? So first of all, you could start core DNS in GitHub. Nowadays, GitHub start is probably the single most important thing for any open source project. <laughs> uh, we, already, uh, we already see 6,000 starts, but it's never enough. Uh, the second thing is we are looking for adopters. Uh, a lot of companies they use, as far as we know, a lot of companies use coding as every day, but for different purposes, they decided not to reveal their name uh, for legal reasons or for name branding or they, we, we respect their choice. But if the organization you, you're in use coding as, and if the organization or the institution is not uh, afraid to reveal their name. You can certainly help to add the name to adopters, and that also give you a chance to uh, open a pull request. And uh, once the pull request is emerged, you are the contributor already, which is uh, you know, a nice thing. Uh, once you became a contributor, you may want to go one step further. Say, okay, if, what if I want to be a maintainer? Uh, to be a maintainer is actually not that challenging, at least for core DNS. Uh, we have, uh, we actually updated our, uh, our chapters. So essentially, if you want to be a maintainer, if you can open one significant pull request, and the pull request has been merged, and if you showed you're willing to reveal pull requests, other people's pull requests, then if there's one more maintainer to sponsor you, you're in. So what a core DNS maintainer gives you. So first of all, that's a very nice badge, right? It's, uh, it's a badge, it's, uh, it's whether or not this badge is uh, big or small to you, it's still a badge. And also, uh, it's associated with CNCF and Kubernetes, so you feel like you're part of the Kubernetes community as well. Uh, like I said, if you want to be a maintainer, just uh, open a pre-request, 
show some interest to reveal other people's pull requests. And that's all you need to do. I think that's uh, pretty much it for, for our introduction session. So, uh, maybe, take some yeah, yeah, I think we can just take some QA. Yeah, sure. Uh, the no six. It's uh, the the coding is actually just uh, individual organization. It's actually just uh, we uh, we work on our own. So it's it's part of the Kubernetes uh, default, but the no association, direct association. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Ooh, that's an interesting question. So, so the question is, in migrating from, from AWS to Google's cloud, and, and you're losing some Route 53 functionality, could you get some of that weighted functionality back using rewrite? Um, not that I'm aware of, and there are several uh, experts out in the room who would know if I, were, if I were lying to you, but I would encourage you to write a plugin to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Core DNS supports the core like views, so you can serve different responses to different clients based on say their source address. Does okay. So the question was, does uh, Core DNS support views? And the the short answer is, I think not directly, but there are other plugins that you can use that can kind of uh, that, that'll allow you to more or less mimic the capabilities of views. If you wanted to do something quite simple, like just say, hey, I want to give this answer to the guy at this IP address and this answer to the guy at this other address, you could do that. Um, views, of course, the facility uh, within Bind is a lot more complex than that. It's basically a full-blown virtual configuration exposed only to some queriers. Um, and, and it's it's not, we, we, we don't have that in Core DNS. Was there a question up here? Yeah. Yeah, what was the reasoning behind switching the default DNS server from Cube DNS to Core yeah, that's a good question. So the question was, what's the, what was the rationale behind moving from KubeDNS to, to CoreDNS? Uh, there were a couple things. I think one of them was that KubeDNS is actually two executables. It's, in fact, DNS three, I think. DNS. It's three. It's, it's KubeDNS, it's DNS mask, and then there's like a sidecar that, that goes with it. Um, a lot of that's, uh, some of it's not Go yeah. as and well. Also so it's DNS not... mask kill. That's uh, one of the biggest reasons for, okay, one of the biggest reasons for Red Hat they're very supportive, like I said, very supportive of seeing coding as to be in Kubernetes, replacing Kubernetes was that. DS must kill was written in C, and they feel like uh, it's kind of insecure. You know, Red Hat, that's, uh, they're working on kernel, so they are very much concerned with security. That's one of the reasons, strong reason, yeah. And, and there was one more question there? Probably a better question for you. That's so the question was, can you run an instance of Core DNS per namespace? That's what you're asking. Yeah. Uh, you essentially saying you okay? Let's let's just uh, rephrase the question. So essentially, you want a multiple Core DNS instances running at the same time? Yeah, I'm, I'm not even sure that's the right way to approach it. I'm very new to Core DNS. Uh, not sure. That's uh, that's a normal configuration, to be honest. Uh, if you, I mean, what's the purpose for you to, to do that? Are you, are you worried about like a performance or low balancing type of thing? No, um, uh, I, I'd be running Core DNS in a multi-tenant Kubernetes environment. Mm. I would not want uh, different uh, customers to be able to use the same Each other's oh, DNS. you know, there, uh, so if, you, if, if what you want is that kind of isolation, you might look at the policy plugin. Okay. That, that might be a better way to, to solve that particular issue. Question over there? Has there been a, a perform, performance testing of the, the comparison of the performance between KubeDNS and, and CoreDNS? Has there been? I don't I'm not. Yes, actually, that's, uh, I think in last update, when we try to go for default with, uh, with Kubernetes, that's actually, we did some comparison. Uh, I'm not sure about the exact number, but I think uh, John probably can provide more details about that.
related theories of results which got a complicated question, but more or less a wash as far as the TPS that was in terms of the features of cordiness in the healthy manner. Uh, thank you. Thanks, John. For, to, two, two completely isolated Kubernetes clusters and allow them, let one to resolve domain names and the other? Yeah, yeah sure. Yes, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. With, another question there? Yeah. Does the reverse lookup plugin work with the Kubernetes plugin? Does the reverse lookup plugin work with the Kubernetes plugin? The reverse lookup plugin is, that's the one that synthesizes a template domain name based on the IP address being reverse mapped, I think. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I, I can CoreDNS, let's just, I just wanted to repeat it. Yeah, can CoreDNS replace console-like functionality? Uh, depending on which area you want to replace, I mean, of course, CoreDNS itself is DNS server, but we do have the ATCD you could use as a backend. That, I think, can cover most of the uh, use cases you want, I would assume, yeah. But if you have a very special edge case, that it's more like case-by-case -case situation. But I, I would definitely say most of the time you probably could already use CoreDNS plus etcd to do what you need with console. Okay. I think we probably have time for one more question if there's another. Over here. Uh, can I host uh, thousands of zones for one CoreDNS instance? Can you host thousands of zones for one CoreDNS instance? Oh, okay. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and you know you might have seen from the plugins that there are various plugins for, for, for hosting zones. You can have primary zones that you load from zone data file. You can have secondary zones. You can have you know a combination of those. I'm just curious if anybody's using CoreDNS for public facing DNS servers. Uh, I, I, yes. Is anyone using CoreDNS for a, a public facing? Yeah, CoreDNS IO. <laughs> CoreDNS .io is served by CoreDNS servers, as you might imagine. It would be a little embarrassing if it weren't. <laughs> Are all resource records supported? Um, it's a good question. I think we. I, th I think I have to say yes in one form or another. Um, we might have to drop down to, to using to using a uh, generic representation. There's an RFC that describes how to how to represent things. I mean, for really really old stuff. If you wanted to put like an, a WKS record or an ancient info record or something like that. Yeah. Any limitations or restrictions on IPv6 uh, within CoreDNS? I'm not aware of any, but if you have any issue or encounter issue, you can certainly open, a, uh, open the issue in GitHub and uh, we'll try to fix that. Yeah, so we're not aware of any, I guess, is the <laughs> short answer. <laughs>